now we're going to begin to look more closely at specific aspects of the geographical and geospatial connections to our energy future. And to lead this initial discussion, we've asked the geographer of the United States to join us. Lee Schwartz is not only the geographer of the United States, yes, he is GOTUS. He is also one of the most respected geo professionals in the world. Lee has led the way to make certain that geography and geospatial science is a ubiquitous part of government decision making at the highest of levels. He has been a strong supporter of AGS for most of his career, and we are immensely proud to have him serve on our council and to represent our profession here in the United States and around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Lee Schwartz. Thank you very much, John. Uh, this isn't all about me, though. Um, it's about my panel here. I'm very excited that we have the uh, first interactive panel of the day. Uh, we're going to talk about energy policies and energy futures. I'm at the Department of State in Washington, D.C., which is the uh, uh, bastion of what is supposed to be policymaking. But what I'm going to focus on today is making sure all of our speakers are grounded and talk about geography, uh, because none of them are actually geographers. Uh, we've invited them to join us anyway, but they each have a unique perspective on the future of our world in terms of energy sources, energy access, energy supplies, and we're asking them to think about the future. It's really hard to take off the, the lens of looking two, three years in the future and think out to 2050. Uh, one reason we have made this uh, 2050 event is because it gives us the freedom to make any speculations that are possible, and most of us won't be around uh, at that point to uh, be proved wrong or right. So my main job here is to keep our panelists on time, and most importantly, to provide an opportunity for the audience to ask questions and to interact with our experts up here. This is a unique event in that we don't have multiple competing sessions that people are looking around and traveling to. Everybody is in one room at one time. We have as much expertise in the audience as we have on stage. And so we're trying to uh, kick this uh, off with as much interaction as possible. You all have your bios of, of the speakers. You might want to look in your packets to make sure, because we're not going to uh, provide any detailed bios. We have uh, an order, though, that we have worked out to try to go from a global perspective to a local perspective. The order in your program is alphabetical. But we're going to start out with Jatin Nathwani from the University of Waterloo. He's going to give a global perspective. We're then going to go to Kristen Mays, who's also going to talk about the broad context of, of energy, but from more of a United States perspective. Uh, we then have Sonia Ye from Chalmers University of Technology. Um, Chris is from Arizona State, by the way. Uh, Sonia is going to talk about a particular sector that she's expert in, which is transport. And then Oscar Ankunda from USAID is going to talk a bit about a, a particular region that he works in that is sub-Saharan Africa. So we're going to go from the global to the local. We're going to talk about broad policies in the future to local context. And we're going to leave plenty of room for interaction and questions and answers. So with that, I'm going to introduce Jatin to kick us off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Good afternoon. Uh, I've entitled my talk uh, called, called Meeting the Signature Challenge of This uh, Century. And there are three themes that, that I would like to, to uh, anchor my remarks. Uh, energy and climate are, are intertwined. I go on to argue that climate change is actually not an environmental problem, it's an energy technology problem. Global warming has been in gestation for over five generations now. Its fix is likely going to take two or three generations. The energy transition will cut across generations requiring new ways of uh, financing, in essence, a global uh, problem of the global common. I go on to suggest that an ecosystem view of energy transition is essential. It is crucial to getting us to a low carbon energy future built on uh, resilient pathways. Last but not least, uh, a low carbon energy system with distributed resources playing a pivotal role will be necessary to deliver 
on the promise of affordable energy for every global citizen of the world. Can uh, Gerhard Richter's art perhaps in some way help us communicate the essential nature of a global existential threat? The risk of floods, famines, tsunamis, melting of ice caps, threatened ecosystems, large extreme single events, all these seem to have a numbing effect on our consciousness. The scientific conclusions emerging from the IPCC reports are about as pungent and conclusive as they can be. It's not clear to me whether our leaders are moved to bold action on the basis of these assessments. Each stripe in this image is the average temperature for that year over 150 plus years. The first picture is the global situation. This is the United States, Switzerland, Germany, England, Toronto where I live, various villages in the UK. This is measured. There is no global circulation models here. This is measured data over five generations. The evidence is pretty clear. I showed this to my three-year-old grandson and said to him, on the left is blue and cold, and on the right it's red and hot. Look at this picture and tell me, what's on the right side? And his reply, red and hot. This is developed by Ed Hawkins. These images provide, in my view, a compelling perspective on, on what we see. And yet it seems our key global leaders do not seem to recognize a pattern that a three-year-old kind of gets it. Let me simplify the global energy challenge and just remember these two numbers. 85% of the global primary energy demand is met by fossil fuels and 15% is the rest of it. Solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, bioenergy, geothermal, and what have you. Uh, the number 15 here, give or take uh, a little bit of statistical license, is, act is the actual level of primary energy demand in the world in terawatts, terawatt years. And over the next four decades, energy demand essentially doubles, 30 to 35 terawatts. And these are, there are immovables, population growth, structure of our economic production, and the shift in income in populations. These are your primary de determinants of doubling of energy demand. Now a two degree C climate warming constraint means that fossil fuels have to decline dramatically. Somewhere close to a share of 50-50, by 2050, let's say, and reversal of that share to something like 1585 by the end of this century. Now imagine building 15 terawatts of new capacity with non-carbon sources of energy on a scale that replicates the size of the entire existing global energy infrastructure. And that is what is required to power our planet future. You might think this is a, a dispiriting story, and it is. Decade after decade, we see no let up in the upward trajectory of emissions and the share of fossil fuels remains stubbornly at the 1990 level, which suggests that bold actions with teeth would become necessary to enforce a global, a global carbon budget somewhere in the order of 1,000 gigatons of carbon emissions for the rest of this century to keep us to the two degree C mark. So it is no longer a question of fossil fuel reserves. They are about three and a half times larger than the carbon budget. Transition risk, therefore, means about 70-odd percent of the stock of non-carbon-based energy reserves could become unburnable or stranded. So the financing implications for managing change on this scale, both at the corporate 
and the country level are not either entirely obvious or trivial. So let's think in terms of solutions that will have to come to play on an exponential time scale across vast geographies and on a global scale. And we have to begin to think in terms of disruptive innovations that perhaps have the potential for solving this complex energy climate conundrum. To get to something useful, we have to ask the big question, what future do we want? And then work backwards to identify the technologies that can bring about such transformative change. And we have done some similar work and developed this view of a low carbon electricity ecosystem. The four core elements are baseload power, smart urbanization, electrified transport, and off-grid electrification, each combining different forms of energy technologies in generation distribution and storage. And I'll leave the details for, for discussion. All this really means is that the architecture of the emerging energy system will be very different from what we have with new players, different market structures, and regulatory arrangements. A smart, intelligent energy network is in essence a convergence of information science and system with the physical energy system. And herein, I think, lies the promise of creation of new economic and social value as ICT becomes ubiquitous and sensors, devices, data analytics turn vast amounts of information into useful knowledge and services. Our vision is to deliver the next generation technologies, innovations, and practical solutions that will drive the costs of energy services to a level low enough for a revolution in energy access that can be sustained without tax incentives or subsidies. The geography of energy inequality is well known, and I ask if in frustration, if not now, when? The persistence of energy poverty and its staggering con consequences on quality of life are actually quite well known. But I'll pick on one statistic. Annual number of deaths directly related to household indoor air pollution equals about four million plus. This unacknowledged silent killer on a global scale exceeds the number of deaths from malaria, AIDS, and TB combined. So this situation requires an urgent call to action as compelling as the threat to climate change. A simple point I'm trying to make in this image, time is the most precious commodity for each one of us in our lives. The drudgery involved in gathering energy for sustenance, simply theft of time, and robs the individual of any meaningful pathway for a decent quality of life. A small amount of energy, magical convergence of ICT with the right device, now provides this gentleman with access to the world's entire knowledge base. Our economic calculus of energy generation and distribution cannot remain indifferent to the needs of so many. So, so close, but so far. So decentralized energy systems offer a cost-effective pathway out of energy poverty. It would be, in my view, an unconscionable tragedy of our times if we solve the carbon problem but leave a third of humanity behind in energy poverty. And I will conclude by suggesting that radical action is needed. Many perspectives converge on this, whether it is the International Energy Agency or the IPCC or the Global Energy Assessment and a number of such studies, the need for radical action cannot be underestimated. And I'll quote this from the uh, Global Energy Assessment. It says, massive diffusion of new technologies for meeting thermal energy, motive power, and electricity services is required to meet the grand challenge of improving energy access. This requires innovations on both technological and institutional levels. Providing universal 
access to electricity is not just a moral imperative. It delivers substantial social, health, and environmental benefits. Last slide. Energy is but an enabler. It's not everything. It's an enabler for creation of wealth and well-being, and at its core, in my view, helps drive most of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Just a touch of advertising. This is some of the work we have done in this area, and uh, I look forward to discussion and comments, uh, your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Sit down. Thank you, Jatin, for printing such a cheery scenario for us all. Um, <laughs> Your mention of time was, was uh, telling to me, and, and I realized uh, I was doing some math in my head, and I'm, I'm, I'm a geographer, not a mathematician, but I started thinking about 2050, and it's not that far away, and most people in the room actually will be alive. Um, myself, maybe not, so uh, I apologize for my ageism in that comment. Uh, it's kind of frightening. So Chris, thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. Um, I might stand up. Uh, to talk today, but uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for, for inviting us to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm Chris Mays, and I'm a professor at Arizona State University. You might notice there's a lot of us here today. Uh, we care a lot about this issue. Um, I also may be the only ex-politician in the room. I'm a recovering politician. I'm a former Arizona Corporation Commissioner, which in Arizona is our Public Utilities Commission which weirdly, and unlike most other states, is an elected statewide office. Um, so I'm here to talk about states. And Jatin talked a, bit, a little bit about the, his view that technology is going to solve the problem um, and that we need radical action. I have a little bit of a different take. I agree technology is going to be important, but I believe policy and law are going to be equally important as we tackle this problem and as we tackle the energy transition. Um, and and I, you'll see why that is. And the, the, the basic reason is that in the United States and in many other parts of the world, utilities essentially control uh, the energy space. And utilities are regulated entities. And so regulation and policy are going to remain probably for the next 20 years until markets completely take over this space. Very important and the regulation of them. So, I believe that the true leaders in energy policy and in the energy transition in the United States have been the states. Uh, let's face it, Congress isn't doing much of anything right now uh, in, in the energy space, unfortunately, but a lot of great action has been happening at the states. Most of your states, wherever you're from, have passed a renewable portfolio standard like we did when I was on the Arizona Corporation Commission. Um, most states have passed an energy efficiency resource standard. Most states have passed net metering policies encouraging rooftop uh, solar, uh, and, and most states have tax credits, and we certainly have the federal uh, ITC and the federal PTC to encourage wind and solar. And that has had a tremendous impact, a tremendous impact. And in fact, it has been incredibly successful. Those policies have encouraged renewables to the point where renewable energy is now the least cost resource available to our utilities to purchase. Just imagine, back when I was on, on the Public Utility Commission, that was not the case. Renewables were far more expensive than any other form of energy. It's also having, uh, these policies are having an impact on how much energy the utilities can produce. So this graph shows you the delta, what happened when we passed an energy efficiency resource standard, forcing our utilities to do more energy efficiency. Basically, it meant that, that our utilities could build 18 fewer power plants. 18 fewer. That's the, we reduced the overall number of power plants necessary in the state of Arizona by 18. Now, utilities didn't like that very much. You can imagine why, because their job, their, their whole business model is around building big power plants, right, and producing electricity. Um, the, these headlines show what I just said, the tremendously uh, impactful, uh, uh, in, the tremendous impact that these policies that all of our states have passed have had. Reduce the cost of, of renewable energy 
uh, to the point where we're seeing record low bids from solar developers into our states. Places like Colorado, Arizona, California, Nevada, all of those states, the utilities have experienced RFPs or put out RFPs in which solar bid into those RFPs as the least cost resource. They won every single bid. Natural gas and coal didn't win those RFPs. We've also seen, an, seen another impact, which is that, that Americans believe in renewables. And in where I come from, uh, they believe in solar energy. Solar is part of Arizona's DNA. It's a part of who we are as a state. And so the vast majority of Arizonans want us to do more solar energy, not less. And that is true uh, pretty much wherever you, where you, wherever you go, depending on the resource that's available there. The other thing is this is a nonpartisan issue. In poll after poll, just as many Republicans, and I'm a Republican, as Democrats support renewable energy and clean energy, which is a great thing to build off of. This shows you the places, the, the hottest markets in the state of Arizona for solar. Um, I won't make you guess, but usually when I talk about this slide, I ask people to guess what the hottest city in Arizona is for solar. It's not Flagstaff, it's not Tucson, liberal bastions. It's Sun City, Arizona the most conservative place on the planet, probably. <laughs> also of more mature age. So you have older folks who are very conservative, who love their solar, who talk about it over the fence post. Literally, they spend time in Sun City talking to each other about how they're running their meters backwards with their solar panels. Um, so it's really popular in, in my state. The other thing that's happening is because it's the least cost resource, many, many companies are deciding we want in on this action. We want to produce our, we want to save money with renewables. And a lot of these companies, in addition to thinking about the bottom line, are, are creating internal, uh, internal objectives for powering their operations with clean energy. So all of these companies have developed some kind of an internal object, objective uh, for powering their operations. Some of these, most of these have said, we're going to power our operations with 100% clean energy, which places tremendous pressure on the utilities in those places to produce and, and provide that kind of energy. Some energy users, like in Nevada, are simply leaving the utilities. They are divorcing the utilities entirely when those utilities will not provide renewable energy to them. So the casinos, most of the casinos in Nevada have basically exited NV Energy, the largest utility in Nevada, um, under a law called 704B. They paid a lot of, they pay a lot of money just to be able to divorce the utility and go out and, and provide themselves less expensive clean energy. Um, some places, so we now have 80 cities, five counties, two, and two states that have also committed to 100% clean energy, a tremendous local success story. Um, and some, some cities, some municipalities have taken it even further and said, we're kind of so sick of the intransigence of utilities that we're going to divorce the utilities. We're going to do what's called condemnation or municipalization of the utility. We're going to take over the utility by law so that we can produce the kind of energy we want. So real quickly, before I go to, to uh, what I think are some of the solutions, I want to talk about from a rate making standpoint. So I teach utility law at Arizona State. Um, this formula, it's the only formula I'll throw out there, but you're a geographer, so you love formulas, right? I guess that's uh, part of the deal. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, trust me, law students don't. So, um, the, but this formula is really important. This underlies, this, this formula explains the entire problem. This is how utility commissions, like the one I used to work on, used to set or do set rates across the, the country. The revenue requirement of each of these utilities is equal to their operating expenses. They basically get all their operating expenses plus 
the value of everything they build, all the power plants and transmission lines and distribution systems that they build, minus the depreciation of that, multiplied by a rate of return, which is kind of like an interest rate on a bank account. That's how they make their money. So what's the problem? The problem is the V minus D part. That's what encourages what we call the CapEx bias. Utilities are incentivized to build big stuff, but building big stuff like coal plants and power, natural gas power plants is what's harming our environment. It's also, by the way, not the least cost resource anymore, as I, I just discussed. Um, it also flies in the face of what all those folks in Sun City want to do when, when they want to put solar panels on their rooftops. So what do we do about this really difficult, tricky problem? Um, these are just the, the areas in the United States that are regulated by markets. These are the places that have an existing market. Though areas in white do not have markets, they are still vertically regulated utilities. Um, what, a, what some states like Hawaii that was discussed earlier um, and New York, where we're sitting today, are doing is they're saying, okay, we're going to look at what the utility of the future looks like. And the, in, instead of saying we want to just let utilities die a slow death or quick death if, if things happen more quickly, we want to transition these, these utilities into providers of a service, whereas today they are providers of a commodity, right, basically electrons. And so the states are looking at, at integrated uh, distribution planning. Instead of just looking at the generation system, they're looking at what does the distribution system need to look like at the very granular local neighborhood level to incorporate all of those new forms of energy like rooftop solar and energy efficiency and electric vehicles and all of those technologies. New York is, is fascinating because basically they are starting to pay the utilities in New York um, a fee, fees, earnings adjustment mechanisms, and platform service revenues based on the kinds of services they want to see the utilities provide. So the, things like bundled communications offerings, partnering with third parties on home energy systems, um, and uh, operating the state's emerging distribution market. So and they provide scorecards for how those utilities are doing in providing those services to customers. Um, and that's sort of the platform uh, service provider model of the utility of the future. The same type of thing is being looked at in the state of Hawaii. The other thing that utility commissions can do is to simply let utilities rate base the right kind of energy. So when I was at the commission in Arizona, we allowed Arizona Public Service Company to rate base 200 megawatts of utility scale solar. And you know, a funny thing happened after we did that. APS started talking about those 200 megawatts of solar on their earnings calls, right? Because they were making money off of it. So utility commissions can start to allow the utilities to rate base what we want them to rate base rather than the big uh, power plants. The other thing is, so a lot of companies like Facebook are going to the, to the states and saying, look, if you, don't let us, if you don't sell us and if your utilities won't sell us renewable energy, we're going to leave. This has become a competitive issue. When Facebook was deciding where their next da big data center was going to, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Nevada were all in competition with each other. New Mexico figured out a model in which the New Mexico utility formed a subsidiary. They provided and built the solar facility that provided energy to Facebook. Facebook didn't have to finance it. They just did a PPA, a purchase power agreement with the utility, and everybody won. So those kinds of arrangements are going to have to happen. This thing is happening. Now I know, you know, my boss Gary Dirks and a lot of folks believe it's not happening at a pace that it needs to happen and I agree with them. But it is happening um, and we have got to find a way to transition our utilities um, uh, into the future in an orderly and not chaotic way. This is my university issue, I'm so proud of it. 
We have more solar on our campus, on our campus as Professor Pasquale, Pasquale loves to talk about, um, than any other university in the world. Um, this is Deer Valley High School. I like to show this whenever I'm talking to utility executives. This is a megawatt of solar on Deer Valley High School in North Phoenix. And we had in front of us the principal of Deer Valley High School at the, at the Arizona Corporation Commission. And we asked him, so why did you do this? You know, you had to put up a little bit of money for this. That's a lot of solar, a little bit of money. He said, you know, commissioners, our, you know, our, 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 our teachers kind of liked the idea. Our administration, you know, our, our, our PTA, our, our, our parents liked the idea. We liked the idea. He said, and you could have heard a pin drop when he said this, it was the students who came in and demanded that we solarize this school. And I say to utility executives across the country, if you're not paying attention to what happened at Deer Valley High School, you're nuts. Because these people are your future customers. And they aren't going to want to worship in a synagogue that's not solarized. They're not going to want to go to a university that's not solarized. They're not going to work in a building that's not solarized. And they sure as heck are not going to live in a house that's not energy efficient and solarized. And that's what we need to be planning for. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for reminding us that politics and policies are, are local. I feel like we maybe should have had a counterpoint, uh, somebody from Maine or Alaska uh, as opposed to Arizona, but uh, I think your point was well made. Our next speaker uh, does like formulas, uh, so let's hear what, what Dr. Ye has to say about the, the transport section, sector and the future of mobility as a huge uh, consumer of energy. So Absolutely. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Sonia Ye. I'm a professor in transport and energy at Chalmers University. I worked at University of California at Davis for, uh, for eight years, and three years ago I moved to Sweden. I've been enjoying the land of IKEA ever since. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about um, mobility, transportation sector, and my key message for all of you is that you've heard the first speaker talk about technologies are really important, they are. Policies or second speaker's uh, key point, key messages is policies are very important, they are super important too. Um, what I want to add is consumers are the ones who hold the key for the future, sustainable future in transportation. So, let's begin. Um, Transportation issue has always been the center of global discussion. Um, you have, but the focus in transportation really is not about climate issues from the beginning, right? You have Global De Development Bank support. Um, the, the Global Development Organizations focus on transportation issues, mostly about economic development, um, about equality, accessibility, air pollution, safety, congestions, all the issues are really not about, are really not about climate change. But things change in Paris when COP21, 2015 in Paris passed the um, Paris Agreement. Transportation um, is lifted, the, the climate issue is lifted within transportation to become one of the most important issues that global leaders, global policymakers, and global citizens should work on. Um, there is, problem, some of you may have heard about the Paris Agreement, and each country should develop their nationally determined contributions, deciding how they want to address their, um, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions from their own country. U.S. has had our NDCs um, by the Obama administration. Uh, I think 197 countries all, have, all developed an NDC plan. Um, within the N NDC plan, transport is a very important component, of course, because transport contributes to about a quarter of global emissions totally, um, global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if you look at the chart, this chart shows the 
NDCs regarding transportation policies proposed by, um, submitted by countries. If you break down, break them into high income countries, middle income countries, um, and the policies sum submitted by the low income countries, in terms of policies to address uh, transportation greenhouse gas emissions, you see very uh, drastic differences in terms of what they think are the important policies in this country to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, for example, in high-income countries, there's actually not much we can do. I mean, technology are pretty far advanced. Um, demand population growth has stabilized. Demand also stabilized. The only major policies proposed by developed you know, high-income countries are mostly electrifi electrification um, and energy efficiency on um, making cars more efficient. But if you look at the policies proposed by median income countries and low income countries, they're still focusing on, the issues they're focusing on are different. Uh, or about public transit, um, about improving the efficiency. Um, a lot of those are really focused on the local issues, congestions, air pollution, um, in reducing energy use. And they're, they're basically focusing on uh, still addressing those conventional issues, but with climate change, with, but reducing greenhouse gas emissions as a co-benefit. We do a lot of work with international organizations such as international energy agencies, um, BP, Shell, Exxon. You probably, some of you probably heard about the World Energy Outlook, the BP Energy Outlook. Shell scenarios, the ocean mountain, different scenarios. You heard about IPCC scenarios. We, we develop a lot of scenarios to look at what the future will look like. Nobody can predict the future, but scenarios are useful. They help us to envision what are the, where are we going? Are we on the right track? Um, um, if we're not on the right track, what kind of policies are needed? But, Developing scenarios are also, it's also a tricky business. We have to anticipate what are the global trends, what are the kind of supply trends in terms of supply, in terms of demand, in terms of policy directions, in terms of technology development. We also need to anticipate what are the policy and technological challenges, um, and markets and geopolitics. And all those are uncertain, and we need to take all those in, into account, and they interact with each other. So um, in terms of thinking about the future, what does the future look like for trans transportation? Um, and I'm going to say that there are basically three major uncertainties when we're thinking about the future of sustainable transportation. The first one is really the policy development and consumer choices. And when I say consumers, I really mean the consumers of all sectors or subsectors of the in, within the transportation. Um, it's not just cars, but also buses, trucks, um, shipping, aviation, and so on, so forth, in the rail, and so on, and so forth. But when we think about the future, um, the kind of projecting to, to the future in terms of what technology they will use, what fuel types they would use, um, would it be hydrogen or electricity? or gasoline, diesel, conventional oil, um, conventional gasoline, diesel, or natural gas. Um, consumers think about a lot of things. It's not just the vehicle cost, the cost of the technology, or the cost of the fuel, but also a lot of intangible factors that are really important. In, for example, most of you probably heard about range anxiety, how many refueling stations are there, how many models of cars are there for consumers to choose from, um, logistics concerns, the technology specification. So consumers think about a lot more things than just the cost of the technology or cost of the fuels. And policies need to develop po adequate policy to address those consumer, consumer barriers. So for example, we look at what are the barriers in economic terms um, that translate to real or perceived cost for consumers. Um, if you look at different cars, for example, if you compare the cost of gasoline car, diesel car, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, fuel cell, and electric cars, it turns out the real cost or the 
perceived cost by consumers, uh, the cost of vehicle and fuels are just small component. The other costs such as model availability, how many models that, that a consumer can choose from, um, the technology risk, refueling availability, how many refueling stations are there, um, range anxiety, and a range of other factors are very important and they're far, far important for in consumer's mind than the, just the vehicle and fuel cost. And I say perceived cost is though some of those costs are not necessarily real. If you ask, actually, can you raise your hand if any of you own any electric vehicles? Very few. And if you ask for those who don't buy electric vehicles, most of them probably will say either they're still too expensive or they say there's just no refueling stations, right? Probably top two. But if you actually look at people who actually drive the electric vehicles, they rarely charge in, refueling, in public charging stations. So that's the perceived cost. People really think that they need their charging stations unless they see, until they see charging stations everywhere. They're not going to buy electric vehicles. But once they own any electric vehicles, they probably don't charge. We have really, really a lot of real data on it. They probably don't charge in public charging stations no more than once a month. So that's kind of the differences between what's the perceived barrier versus the real barriers. So consumers' decisions are extremely important. The second major uncertainty is the demand growth. Um, the dot there shows the demand of OECD countries in developed countries in 20, 2005, which is far greater than the demand um, from developing countries in 2005. On the x-axis is total fuel consumption, y-axis is total greenhouse gas emissions. We, when we look ahead, can, um, the, the, the total fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions from the developing countries are not going to be too far from what they were consuming in 2005. They probably, they're already stabilized. But the demand growth from developing countries are going to expand really fast. Um, who, actually, who knows how many cars we own in the United States? And it's pretty similar in OECD countries. Cars per 100 people? Two and a half. What's that? Two times, two, 250. All right. Oh, in the US, we own 250 per 100. per 100 people. OK. I guess when I say people, I actually mean the overall population. So it's about 75 per 100 overall. How many cars in China? Per 100 people? Five. Five, not really. Five is probably India. In China, it's about 25, 20 to 25. And so if they imagine, who knows who is the largest oil-consuming country in the world? China. So imagine when they, if they try to match the same level, how would that contribute to the growth um, in, in energy demand? And that is just the, trans, that's just the car sectors. Then you have the trucks, aviations, they're flying a lot more, shipping, the demands are growing. So really the, the demand story is the story in China, India, Brazil, in those de developing countries. Um, in, like I say, in developed countries, we have very efficient cars, we have very good technologies, um, but the, and demand and popu the, the demand level and population have, are saturated. In developing countries, they want more cars, they want more travels, um, and they're entitled to that. But that has significant implications in terms of global energy demand and global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, very quickly, I'm going to wrap up now. In the, trend, the third trend may uncertainty is the three evolutions in transportation sector. Transportation has not changed in the last 100 years. But in the last 10 years, there are three major evolutions that most of you have experienced. The first one is the electrification of everything. Electrification of cars, trucks, Tesla trucks is a good example, ships, and even airplanes. Um, they're efficient, they're low emissions, and they ha but they ha also come with barriers, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the range and the cost. 
The second evolution is the mobility of the service, MOS. Most of you have done car sharing, ride sharing, scooter sharing, all those kind of sharing. F transportation services focus on the service is the second evolution. Um, lots of companies are investing in it. Um, the third evolution is autonomous vehicles. Um, the benefits, it's, say, it's probably increased the safety, reduced congestions, but there are also a lot of un uncertainty and unknowns whether it would actually increase the demand, what would be the impact on the city level on the urban scale. Those are lots and lots of unknowns and lots of research on autonomous vehicles. But ultimately, I think these three innovations, the first one is really driven by policy, second one is driven by consumers, the third one is driven by the industry. Those three revolutions are really have different drivers moving them forward, but I'm sure they will change our, the future of transportation in a very, very significant way. So just to recap, transportation system is a very important in our future energy system. Lots of uncertainties, and we are keeping an eye on, and I think it's, we have a very exciting future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sonia, for, for introducing uncertainties, although I, I heard a lot more certainty, I think, in a lot of your predictions than uncertainty. And we are now going to move to a part of the world which is very different from um, Arizona. Uh, Oscar and Kunda uh, from my sister agency uh, in Washington, D.C., the U.S. Uh, agency for International Development, will talk about um, off-grid energy in sub-Saharan Africa. Oscar. Thank you, Lee. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, I am from Uganda. Yes. That's in sub-Saharan Africa. So my, yes, you said this. So my, my story today is really about what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think it's very important to note at the beginning that things are happening much faster in sub-Saharan Africa than perhaps anywhere else. We, we, for example, where you have moved from, you know, from coal, you are exploring renewable energy with some marbid, some resistance. I think we, we are lucky in Africa because we are, we are skipping some steps. We have moved from hydropower and we have gone to distributed energy systems already. We have moved on the tele telecommunication side from uh, not having landlines to having cell phones only. So we didn't have to invest in, 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 in infrastructure, you know, that comes with landlines. And that's the innovation that's driving the power sector in, 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 in sub-Saharan Africa. So if, if Mike, I think, presented this visual as, as he started, and everyone talks about Africa in terms of darkness, and, and that is correct, uh, you will see that perhaps most of sub-Saharan Africa actually is not lit at night because we don't have sufficient electricity. Over 600 million people in sub-Saharan Africa are not connected to any sort of electricity. So then the issue is, why is this scenario even so? Well, number one, the cost of extending power on grid power from one community to another is actually quite expensive. One kilometer of a distribution line is around $30,000. And that's basically not going to make it very viable to actually move it. Now, from a regulatory point of view, we are better because we have actually autonomous uh, regulatory authorities that actually do set cost reflective tariffs. Uganda, where I come from, is the only country in the world that actually has cost reflective tariffs across generation, transmission, and distribution. So we are okay from a regulatory point of view. But, I, but what the problem is, is that we are not connecting as many people every year as the number of structures we have, also in relation to the population growth rate that we have in this, on the continent. On average in Uganda, we, it's in Kenya, Tanzania, it has always been a progression of around 2% increase in access rates. Our population rate in Uganda is 3.2. Energy demand grows at an average of 10.2% per year. So we are always behind. So this is how off-grid solutions come in, and this is the center of my, of my conversation with you today. The World Bank estimates that of the 600 not, not connected, we can actually connect them using mini-grids, 
and then solar home systems. Solar home systems are the most, I think, the easiest because in terms of acquisition, their payment innovation that we have seen come into play, uh, we have a, a significant reduction in system pricing over the last five years. Uh, we have production obviously being outsourced to mainland China, uh, when, which has, I think, significantly affected the cost of production of, of especially solar modules, what they call panels. So in essentially what we're looking at is that on grid we have three significant problems in sub-Saharan Africa. We have where people are staying next to the grid, but the grid is actually not robust enough to surprise them with electricity on an everyday basis. So we, we, call that, we, we call that a bad grid. We also have an idle grid where people are just not using electricity. We, the worst scenario is where we actually have a grid, I think you showed the visual of it, where people actually are under the lines, but they are not connected. The biggest challenge has always been around the initial upfront connection cost, because people have to pay utilities to actually make a connection. Secondly, people have to wear their houses before they get the connection. These costs are normally around three, between six to eight hundred dollars. Rural households in Africa will not afford that. So the, the, the tendency has now been, can we go to a solar home systems that could provide not ultimately perhaps the same level of service as I will demonstrate later on, but can actually help us build demand over time as we hope that the, you know, the grid comes closer to us. So we have also issues of, of, uh, of last mile connectivity because electricity in sub-Saharan Africa is always a political tool. And uh, John mentioned you guys have a two year cycle we always have a cycle every day, okay? <laughs> it's, and, and politicians use it to basically galvanize support. And, and what happens is that those who shout louder get a line going their home because they their way. And those who don't, they get squat, as, 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 as you say. So we have, we have segments, what we call last miles, that actually don't have electricity now. Even the grid expansion plan, they are not going to get electricity in the medium term, five to seven years. So then from a strategic point of view, how do you ensure that those people actually have access to electricity? And this is where off-grid solutions have come into play, especially solar home systems. I would talk about mini-grids too, but I will have a segment where I briefly talk about them, but this largely will be about solar home systems. In Uganda alone, we have attracted around 100 and, over 120 million in solar in investment uh, towards solar home systems. We have, I think, last year alone, we attracted around $60 million in financing for two off-grid companies. That was the first in Uganda. Kenya has obviously led the conversation on solar home systems uh, due to digital financial services. So in terms of systems sold, you will notice that of the four million systems that have been sold, that were sold in 2007, the bulk of them are actually in sub-Saharan Africa. What's very unique too is also that the size of these systems is rather small. You're talking at a maximum of 10 watt peak systems. So what they do provide, according to the multi-tier framework, is basically you around four to six hours of light, uh, perhaps capacity to power a radio, um, three bulbs, and pretty much that's it. So it does not enable such a home to use such energy productively. Or turn, or from the social development aspect, obviously, there is improvement in health, in access to light for students to, to study at night, but that's pretty much it. And this is where the political definition for solar home off-grid systems and on-grid power has always hinged because people in Africa demand on-grid electricity because they think in their heads you know, that there is a better quality of service. Yet we have proven now that with mini-grids, with distributed, you can actually get the same level of service and even use it to help improve the existing distribution network. So what have been the, what have been the, the success factors for the off-grid revolution we have seen in Kenya, in Tanzania, uh, I mentioned at the dialogue today, 
Everyone here has a, f a cell phone. You use these cell phones for incredible things. You do, you do trade, you, you all sorts of things. In Africa, the number one thing that people use a cell phone for is actually commercial transactions, payment for items both. And, and what these cell phones have done is, tr is transform the off-grid sector because we, we call it digital financial services. Solar companies actually owned by Americans. Uh, Phoenix is owned by, was owned, started by an American lady, uh, I think from Silicon Valley. Uh, what they have done is they have tapped into cell phones to be able to sell solar home systems. So a solar company can now credit profile an individual within 30 days because they have their payment history on the phone. They are promoting financial inclusion. They are layering more, pro layering more products on the solar home system they are selling because the solar home system is acting as collateral. So for, this, for, for some of us who don't know what this is, is, instead of me going to buy a solar home system and I have to pay $300 up front, a solar company gives it to me and I pay $10, perhaps. Then I stagger the rest of the payment over an 18 month period and pay using my mobile phone. If I delay paying, the system is digitally enabled, the solar company has an IT person who actually switches it off. Yeah, so that's the, that's the, the, the evolution, that we, the innovation that we're seeing in there. Uh, so we are now moving toward productive use where off-grid systems can be used actually to, to support agro-productivity, which is the mainstay of economies in sub-Saharan Africa. I think we are also seeing significant uh, improvements in the neighboring environment for off-grid investments. That's why we're attracting a lot of foreign uh, direct investment actually targeting, targeting the sector. Uh, I also mentioned, obviously, the, 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 the prices. One question that I think we should ask ourselves as we move forward is, as the prices continue to reduce, as we have reverse auctions attracting all sorts of, you know, close to, I don't want to use the word ludicrous, but uh, three cents per unit of electricity, and it is going down. We saw that in Mexico, we saw that in Africa, in Zambia. How sustainable is it? actually use these solutions in a commercial, in a commercial sustainable manner. Um, I, I, this, I had put this here to kind of highlight the trajectory of, of towards universal access and how off-grid solutions will still continue to play an important role, especially because, as I mentioned again, Governments cannot invest in distribution systems that will cover everyone in sub-Saharan Africa. We're trying to have PPPs where we can attract private capital, but it's still a huge, a huge investment, and, and the, the return would affect the bottom line, especially because of the low utilization of end users in, in, in rural communities. So this is the last slide, yeah. So, um, in the future, for me, the conversation obviously has to be around innovation. How can we make off-grid systems more productive uh, so that uh, end users see the value proposition for them, especially in terms of earning more money, efficiencies in production? Uh, how can we talk about, uh, how can we promote mergers like the one we recently saw in Uganda where NG, which is a big French uh, infrastructure company, took over a, an off-grid company that was operating in Uganda and Zambia. And, and they are, what they're doing is they're investing significant amounts of money in R&D now so that they can actually focus on off-grid refrigeration facilities. They are focusing on, on, on mills, for metal, metal fabrication plants, and the like. Uh, I, the other issue is on regulation. The off-grid solutions have always operated freely with minimum regulation from the states and governments in Africa. As we continue to evolve and see this innovation, utilities are diversifying and using on-grid electricity, but identifying off-grid solutions as alternative business centers within the overall business models. And then this Yes, on that. And this basically means that the regulatory framework has to change. So how do we get to that point where we can actually have both models re regulated? Uh, the other bit, perhaps, that I should mention here is 
two. One, mini grids are very key in off grid. They are also key in balancing the distribution networks that we will have in sub Saharan Africa in the years to come. However, we still need to have a conversation on on interconnectivity, on cost reflective tariffs, they are overly reliant on subsidies 10 years from now. Can they operate as standalone with viable business models that actually have a good bottom line for their owners? The last bit for me is on consumer financing. We have seen a lot of financing going to project promoters, developers, mini grid operators, distribution companies. Will we have a conversation around financing for end users so that they can actually invest in productive capacities to utilize electricity? This, this is the story I can hand this over to you. All right, well, thank you very much, Oscar. And thank you. Bringing us right up to 2050 and, and showing perhaps that there are more similarities uh, than differences between Sun City, um, Arizona and Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> So we have 15 minutes for questions and answers. Could I get a, a quick uh, show of hands to see how many questions are out there? Just uh, do a quick survey. I'm sure you'll think of questions as, as we move forward. I'm going to ask that the, the people who ask questions try to direct their question to a specific panelist if necessary. And then if not, if it's a general question, uh, we're going to just ask one panelist to respond. Uh, so that way, uh, we'll give the audience as much time to engage as possible. So first question, please identify yourself also. Uh, I'm Vasilis Uthenaikis, uh, Columbia University. Um, actually, one of the three architects of the Grand Solar Plan for the United States, published in 2008 in Scientific American, and then with several journal publications elaborating on that. And uh, in that plan, we accounted for a large of wind from the high plains, and the large of solar from Arizona, and uh, all <laughs> around the Southwest, getting to the big lows in Miami, in Atlanta, in New York. And uh, so this is really the issue that uh, Dr. Actually Nadvani brought, uh, the distribution of the geographical uh, energy inequality. It's much better with renewable energy than with fossil because almost every country has some actually renewable, others more hydro, more wind, more solar. In the United States, we're blessed having all of this, but again, there is a geographical really inequality. So in order to have solar in the winter in New York, we need Arizona, we need you. And the plan was for high voltage DC. And actually we have showed in those studies the technical and economic feasibility for high voltage DC, five gigawatt, 800 kilovolt, we have uh, lines in South America, in China, a new line enacted last week, more than 2,000 kilometers. So it is technically and economically very feasible. What are actually your thoughts about connecting long distance with high voltage DC and get more renewable into the rest of the country? Who wants uh, to volunteer? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that because I'm a, thank you for your question and I, am, I have always been a huge proponent of extra high voltage uh, transmission lines and I agree with you that DC is, uh, is probably the, where we're going. Um, I, I think the one thing standing in the way of building that line that you're talking about or those lines, because there have been a couple of proposed studies like the ones you did, um, is, 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 is frankly the fact that we have a state-by-state -state, uh, transmission siting process. So when I was at the Arizona Commission, Public Utility Commission, we, have our, we had our own, and we approved transmission lines that went through Arizona, but then New Mexico could say no, or Colorado could veto it. So you essentially have a state-based siting process and regulatory process, and FERC can only overrule those states in very rare uh, circumstances. So I think that, that uh, unless Congress were to intervene, and I, I sort of have mixed feelings about that because I think it's important to have state involvement in siting, that it's, it's gonna be very difficult to build the lines we're talking about. <clears throat> what I think is more feasible is sort of the regional lines, big, regional lines that could carry, say, for instance, wind from Kansas to Arizona or solar 
uh, to Kansas. I think one that, that carries from Arizona to New York is a, is a ways off, but it's, it's, an, it's, it's a great idea, and I'm a big believer in transmission. Thank you. Thank you. Quick response, yeah, Oscar? Yes. Very quick. Uh, in, in Africa, we actually have power pools, West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. And what we're doing is we're actually planning for interconnectivity of all these countries using transmission lines. For example, we expect to get electricity from Ethiopia, which will have around 8,000 megawatts of electricity coming online in the next four years. And we have a transmission line that moves from Ethiopia through Kenya to Uganda to Rwanda to Zambia, a one that tees off to the Democrat to the Congo where they have an, a huge extractive sector. So yes, the key issue that will come with it is to have an interconnectivity standards regime that ensures uniformity uh, and forget about wheeling, forget about uh, PPAs. There will be economics, tremendous economics involved because each country is attaining efficiency in generation, so tariff rates will be varying, but there must be a standard code of compliance that all states, all governments are actually adhering to to ensure that power is transmitted uniformly across, 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 across the, the various regions. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, my name is Jeff Zeiss. I'm with Between the Poles. Um, this is probably aimed at uh, Dr. Nathwani. Um, and that is that if you look at absolute emissions, the story, it does continue to go up. But if you look at emissions intensity, I think the story is a little bit better. Um, and if you look at electric power generation in the United States in particular, you know, traditionally, if you look at any country and you want to look, you look at economic development, and you look at power generation, they go their lockstep. But if you look at the United States in the last few years, transmission has been pretty well flat. Um, economic development has continued at whatever weight you want to agree to, two or three percent, something like that. But you look at emissions from the power sector, electric power sector, and it's dropped dramatically. Um, and I think that's a a really important story, and I, I'm just citing the United States because I know more about that than, others, than other places, but I think you'll find similar things specifically at the electric power sector. Other sectors are different, and I'm just wondering what you feel about that. So the question is? The question is, um, don't you think we've made some significant progress, and if we continue doing this, in other words, decoupling economic development from power generation, other types of things, other, you know, basically something that generates emissions, that isn't that a feasible approach to becoming more sustainable? Let me, let me respond to that. Uh, you make an absolutely valid point. The U.S. emissions have gone down uh, over the last five, eight years anyway, uh, all because of uh, the enormous value that uh, natural gas has played in the system in terms of being able to displace some of the coal, and so it's a very positive development in terms of what we've seen here in the U.S. in terms of emissions performance of the country. Uh, but you raise actually a more fundamental and deeper, longer-term question about both U.S. and globally, and, and, and the linkage between emissions and GDP growth and so on. So let me, let me throw something at you which, which is actually quite interesting. If you take the last 30 years of global GDP growth, uh, it was, uh, uh, whatever it was, uh, four, three, three and a half percent or so, three percent annual global GDP growth. The energy intensity, actually, the amount of emissions related to GDP were down one and a half percent. So that was a, a, a positive in terms of growth went up, the emissions rate declined at one and a half percent. If you now fast forward to for the rest of the century from 2015, let's say, to the end of the century and assume that global GDP growth will be in the order of two, two and a half percent is what the numbers look like, that emissions intensity would have to go down three times more, not one and a half percent, but about four and a half to five percent to achieve the kind of target that we're looking for, the two degree C mark. So the focus on emissions intensity in terms of rel relation to, to GDP growth we will still have to do a substantial amount more uh, looking at economy-wide. Thank you. Another question?
Good afternoon. My name is Bill Meehan with Esri. I wanted to talk about transport a bit. Uh, can you talk about the uh, electrification or the maybe the lack of electrification of freight rail? Uh, we think of, of public transportation as electri electrified, but with better signaling and electrif electrification of freight rail, rail, that would reduce the uh, dependence on diesel and it would reduce substantially reduce emissions from, uh, from diesel locomotives. Plus, uh, electric locomotives are much more efficient. With a more efficient rail system, we could reduce the number of intercon intercontinental or cross-country trucking. Great. Could you talk about Sorry, that, please? This one's yours. Um, when you, you, you were thinking about rail, I guess I, I would have to admit that I don't know the rail system too well. I think the sector, subsectors I know more are the uh, light duty heavy trucks, aviations and shipping, but rail is the sectors that I actually don't know too much. So I would agree with you that if we can electrify the rail, there could be some emission reductions, but I actually don't know the, the rail sector in terms of technologies and policies that well. So. Jatin, last word, one minute left. Just to add to the point here, actually the rail sector uh, is not in Canada and the United States, not as good as I would like it to be, but certainly if you look at Europe, Japan, electrification of rail is a powerful vector to go down and much can be achieved in terms of decarbonization through electrification if that electricity is produced from non-carbon sources. Great. Chance for one more question? Uh, if it's a 20-second question and a 30-second uh, answer. All right, Marilyn Brown from Georgia Hi, Tech. I'll be speaking tomorrow. I wanted to get back to the um, intensity, the so-called good news story about electric, uh, this electricity sector, the carbon intensity is dropping, you know, but climate change is not a function of carbon intensity unless you call it concentration of CO2 in the environment, in the atmosphere, excuse me. Um, and now when you look at renewables, the latest worldwide stats suggest that we've been increasing the share of renewables globally at 1% per year. We're now at 26%. At that rate, it will take us to the end of the century to move to 100% renewables, we can't afford the natural gas uh, domination for very long. We've got to move. So my question is, how do we accelerate? What's the accelerant? Um, I'm kind of becoming enamored of the um, Steve Sorrell, Benjamin Sobequil idea about yanking the worst out of the um, out of the system. In other words, right, pull so pull the. Yeah. So how do we accelerate? I'll, yeah. give, I'll give each uh, panelist a, a one-word response. How do we accelerate? <laughs> Putting you on the spot. Uh, markets. All right, markets. Jatin? Uh, technology innovation. All right, Sonia? <laughs> I'm going to say all three. Um, technology, policy, and consumers. With a hyphen in between each word, all right. Oscar? Results-based financing for new projects. It's, okay. it's hard to change the status quo for existing uh, infrastructure projects. So you Great. must, yes, support All new right. ones. Well, thank you very much. And please join me in uh, thanking the panel.